Emma. And I'm Helena. And we both work at the Emma's Trust. Just a little disclaimer, this um, is being recorded over Zoom, as you might have noticed if you're actually watching this. And so apologies if the sound is iffy at any stage, please do bear with us. We'd like to welcome you to our podcast, Multiple Sclerosis, Breaking It Down. And this time we'll be talking about the often misunderstood topic of advanced care planning. The Emma's Trust recently published an information book called Thinking Ahead. Um, I'm holding it up um, at the moment. Um, if you're listening to the podcast, you obviously can't see that, but and it's also quite blurry on the screen. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, it's a nice blue, blue cover um, and it says Thinking Ahead on it. Um, um, and uh, we recently published this information book, uh, which is called Thinking Ahead, Setting Out Your Wishes for Your Future Care and Treatment. And it's a useful resource designed to help you with to understand and to share your personal values, preferences for your future medical care with your loved ones and your healthcare team. So the resource, as uh, demonstrated by Helena just then, uh, was produced by Ali, who's a member of our information team here at the MS Trust as well as some MS specialist nurses and subject experts uh, called Ellie Garlick and Sarah Rudrick. So we thought, why not invite them along to shed some more light on the subject? And it's quite an important topic with lots of things to discuss. So I think we should just jump in straight ahead and uh, hear from the trio. Just a quick thing before we start the interview. Uh, Although we discuss various elements of advice, advanced care planning there are a few mentions of end of life care and things like that which some listeners and viewers may find upsetting um so thanks everyone for joining me today to talk about advanced um care planning especially giving up some of your time on such a hot day and spending it indoors to discuss this one but obviously it's a really important topic um so would you all just like to start off by telling me a little bit about yourselves including things like your name your job title and your link to ms so my name's sarah roderick I'm a multiple sclerosis specialist nurse and I work in Huntingdonshire, which is part of Cambridge and Peterborough. Um, and I helped write the, the booklet on Thinking Ahead document, which is why I'm here. Hi, I'm Ellie Garlick and I'm also a multiple sclerosis specialist nurse. Again, I work with Sarah in Huntingdonshire um, so, and we work together on the Thinking Ahead document. Uh, my name's Ali Whittam. I'm an information content development officer at the MS Trust. And part of my role is to create content for our publications and our website and to look at developing ideas for new content where we think there's a lack of information. Um, so can you just tell us a little bit about the publication, Thinking Ahead, and why you decided to get involved, Ellie and Sarah? Uh, Well, for me, um, I attended the MS Trust conference in 2021, which is for health professionals. And one of the sessions there was on advanced care planning. And it looked at how health professionals can support people with MS who want to document how they'd like to be cared for if their health changes. And I thought it was a really fascinating topic. And it just made me really think that we didn't have any information for people with MS about this topic. And I thought it would be something that would be really useful to put together. And then for Ellie and I, um, we we both have a background in palliative care. And ever since we've been MS nurses, we've always, I've I've sort of come to conference with different examples of advanced care planning booklets and said, can we do this? And last year we we decided after they'd had the the conference and and the session on advanced care planning, now was Mm -hmm. the time that we should really offer to do it because it wasn't getting done so we we sort of Ellie emailed and said um would this be something that you would be happy if we if we wrote something for you and and luckily that that's what happened I think we're we're in quite a difficult different situation to a lot of MS nurses in that we have worked in palliative care and that's not a common background for people and so um, you know, using our skills that we have from before was we just felt that we should we should do that and, and offer our, up our help. <laughs> Which to my relief, because I started looking at it and realised it was a really complex issue and, and something that I didn't have any experience of. So I was just so delighted when the email popped up from <laughs> Sarah saying we'd really love to do this. Will you collaborate mm-hmm. with us on it? And it was just like, yes, please. And we just went from there. Yeah, I think. Both Sarah and I are really enthusiastic about advanced care planning. It's you know, something that 
I've seen it make a big difference in how confident people feel about their future. And you know, we really wanted to have something for people with MS that we could offer. Mm. So sort of the subheading of the um, publication is setting out your wishes for future care and treatment. What does that actually involve? Because I think a lot of people think that planning ahead is so focused on end of life care, but that's not necessarily the case, is it? Not, not really. It's, it's about almost making, letting people know what's important to you. And that could be anything. It doesn't necessarily need to be about the end of life. It could just be how you want to live your life um, and, and making sure that people understand what is important to you. That's the main aspect of it, really. I think the, th the thing that I really learned from it was, you know, when I was first thinking about it, I really thought it was going to be people um, with more advanced MS who might want to think about doing this. But, you know, I very, very quickly realised that actually it's appropriate for anyone living with MS and that it's something that it's never too early to start thinking about mm. in place. And, and actually, it's not just for people who have MS. You know, you and I should probably be yeah. thinking about it and having these discussions. It's, mm. it's for everybody. None of us know what's around the corner for, you know, at any time. And so it's important that we all have these, these thoughts and share those things with, with people that are important to us. Absolutely. We've all got our own things that are particular to us that if, if we weren't able to, to make our wishes known, we would want the people looking after us to know because they're they're part of what makes up what makes us us. Yeah. Um, and yes, absolutely. Advanced care planning is very much about living. It's it's not about dying. It's about living and having quality of life while you're still alive. And making sure yeah. that everyone knows what's important to you. Yeah. Um. So just going back to people with MS, why do you think it's such an important project for the MS Trust? And why would you say sort of in a sentence, why is it important for people with MS to plan ahead? I think for people with MS, there are times when they may, may become a bit more forgetful. It's quite common for people to have infections and things like that. And, and at those times or in, in a crisis, it's harder for people to process and make their decisions known. Mm -hmm. So if it's done beforehand when things are calm and there, there isn't a crisis or they're feeling as well as they possibly can, then, then that makes it easier for them to make their wishes known. From an MS Trust point of view, um, advanced care planning can be quite an emotional subject and it could be a difficult topic to broach. And I think it's really important that as an organisation, we don't shy away from providing information on difficult topics like this, especially if there's nothing there from any other information providers. Mm. That's where I felt really strongly we needed this. Mm. Absolutely. I mean, so when we were looking around, when we were starting work on this project and we were looking at what else is available, you know, there are some brilliant resources from, from other organisations but there was nothing specifically aimed for people with MS that we were able to find. So you know, we felt that having something specifically for people with MS would make a real difference. And certainly so far, since we've had the, the booklet, it's been great being able to, to go out and have something to give to our patients. That's brilliant. Yeah, I think I heard when people came back from our annual conference this year that all of the publications had sort of flown off of the shelf or the table as it was. Well, they'd taken 600 copies with them and none came back. So it was obviously we identified a, a gap and it really genuinely was there. So, Ali, you sort of mentioned that um, it is quite a difficult subject to broach um, and sometimes people do shy away from it. What do you think... Uh, this is a question to all three of you, I suppose. What do you think are some of the boundaries for people having those discussions? I think a lot of it is about fear of the unknown. I mean, I know we're saying that advanced care planning, it's about living, it's not about dying, but it is thinking about the future and how things change and how your health might change. And that's quite a frightening topic for a lot of people. And I think a lot of people don't know what decisions you can make in advance. And if you don't know that you're able to make your wishes known in this way and you're able to make decisions in advance, then you can't do it. Um, so I think you know, that's 
it's really important to get the message out there that you do have the power to make decisions and make plans for yourself um, so that then people can do it. I think another thing is is just time. You know, it's prioritising what's important to you. And um, this is something that, although it might be important to people, other things in life take over. And so, um, you know, it, it, that could be a boundary is that people think, oh, this is going to take me ages. But actually, by using the book and almost taking it step by step and, and thinking, which bit do I really, really want to get sorted? You know, so maybe that is just having a conversation with your family. So at le- in the least, your family know what's important to you. And then coming up with a plan, you know, perhaps in the next three months, let's think about the next step, what's important, rather than doing it all. Because I think if you think about it all in one go, it can be a bit overwhelming and, 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 and life takes over. So that can certainly be a boundary to people. You know, if you're living quite well with your MS and your symptoms aren't having a big impact on you now, I think like Ellie says, you know, there's a little bit of fear that, you know, you want to live in the moment and mm. not really think about what the future might hold. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. But we always try and say to people, thinking about the future, planning for the future, thinking about that worst case scenario, what, what would you do if that doesn't make the future happen any quicker? It just means that then if something changes, if there is a crisis, you're prepared for it. And is there sort of an ideal or a perfect time to start having um, a think about these things? I would say now. To me, it could be any (laughs) time. Yeah, any time, really. But but I suppose... um, you know, there are times when, so for us, make, having conversations with our patients, for example, it will often be when we, when we know them fairly well um, and we're seeing that they're struggling with certain aspects of their life. Even if it's just, you know, the stairs is becoming more of a problem and we might just start having conversation about, you know, what, how, would, how would you manage in your house if you couldn't manage the stairs one day? Um, not and I think it's about not necessarily when if you couldn't manage the stairs at all you know sometimes heat it might be really hot or you know just think times when when somebody's MS is harder for them they're having a harder day and how would they manage if their toilet was upstairs and they were living downstairs those sort of practical things that's when we would start having those conversations with people and that I guess that's that's when sometimes people might start thinking about it themselves mm-hmm. as well. Some pe- people are super organised and, and like to have things mapped out and you know even as early as diagnosis they might want to yeah. back to, you know for other people you know there might be a sudden change in their health or they see something happen to a friend or a family member and that might prompt them to think about it but I think you know for some people they might never really feel ready. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And that's a really important point. Advanced care planning isn't compulsory. You know, if it's not right for you, then you don't have to do it. But it's something that a lot of people do find really reassuring and it can make people feel a lot more secure about their future, you know, knowing that their wishes are known and that and that people will hopefully respect those wishes <laughs> and follow the plans that they've made. And also um, that they have some control of the mm, future. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's about giving people back control. When you're diagnosed with a a long-term condition that future that you imagined that you saw for yourself suddenly looks a lot different and being able to make plans and say what you would want what you wouldn't want you know, it, it gives someone back a little bit of that control it's also important to say you know when you're thinking about what the perfect time is that an advanced care plan it's not something that you sit down one day and say right I've written my advanced care plan and that's that you know, it's done now. Mm. Advanced care planning is a process and you might do a little bit of it now and you might sort of think about a few things that are important to you. And then as you go through life, you know, all our priorities change as we go through life in different phases of our life. So you might want to add something to your advanced care plan. You might want to take something out of your advanced care plan. You might want to tear the whole thing up and start mm. again because it's yours. It is your plan and it's belongs to you it doesn't belong to the healthcare team looking after you it's yours and you can add to it you can change it you can start again you know as your thoughts and feelings about what you would and wouldn't want change um so in the document itself 
um we've had sort of a little bit of a look myself and Helena and obviously there's some quite technical terms in there for some people that don't know so much about the topic uh one of the things obviously that's mentioned is lasting power of attorney could you explain to some people who may be watching or listening what that term means and what it involves so I think to think about a lasting power of attorney you have to think about you know what happens now so at the moment, if I go to the doctors and they offer me a treatment or then it's up to me to make a decision about whether I accept that or refuse it and what make choices about what I want. If I wasn't able to make those decisions myself, so no adult can give or refuse consent on behalf of another adult unless they've got a lasting power of attorney set up. So a lasting power of attorney gives somebody the ability to be your voice if you're not able to, to make your wishes known yourself. And there are two types. You can give somebody the power to make decisions about your property and finances or your health and welfare, or you can give someone both of those power of attorney so that they can make decisions on both topics. And that allows that person, if you lose the ability to make decisions for yourself, so just because you set it up, they can't interfere unless you lose capacity. So, but if you do, then they have the ability to speak with your voice, as it were, and make decisions on your behalf. And you can appoint one person, or you can appoint more than one person, and you can either decide whether they make decisions together or if one person can make decisions individually. Brilliant, thank you, that's really helpful. And I think um, it's really important, like you said, to emphasize the fact that it is only if you lose the power to make those decisions. Because I think some people hear about last in power of attorney and they get these ideas from things that they've seen in quite sensationalist newspapers about people running off with other mm. people's money and um, powers and things like that. So I think it's really good to get all the facts on that one. Yeah, absolutely. And there are safeguards so a lasting power of attorney must be registered with the office of the public guardian and um, so it has to be officially registered which you can do online or you can print off a paper form and, and send that off and there are safeguards there is the court of protection so if a, someone who is has a lasting power of attorney starts abusing that power and making decisions that aren't in your best interest or are motivated by the wrong thing then they can the power of attorney can be removed it's very rare for that to happen but it is possible so if you've listened to this podcast or watched the video version um, or have read the publication itself already and you're now starting to think about uh, planning your future wishes is there a specific way that you should go about in recording them for example is it something that needs to be done quite formally like when you're writing a will or can you just uh, jot something down in a notepad? It can be a formal document, if that's what you feel comfortable with. And there are some templates that we signposted to in the booklet, but making that sort of basic um, you know, recording of your wishes, it can be in whatever format you're comfortable with. So you could write a list of bullet points, or you could write a letter to your family or you can write it in one of those documents that has some prompt questions if that helps you to think about the process. And then there are some more formal things you can do like appointing a lasting power of attorney, or if there's a specific medical treatment that you know you wouldn't want, then you can make an advanced decision to refuse treatment, to refuse that particular treatment. And that does have to be done in a certain format and you would need to involve your healthcare team with that because you need to make an informed decision just like you do with a, a decision that you would be making about now it still has to be an informed decision. In terms of things that you could put in your plan have you got any sort of examples of different um, suggestions that people could add into it? It could be anything and everything almost you know it could be practical things like do you like what sort of music you like what sort of um, you know some people, some women, for example, might might always say, I, I always want to be seen with makeup on, so please put lipstick is really important to me. Whatever it is, down to more um, 
you know, specific things around? Um... It could be the little things that are really important to us, or it could be sort of the, the bigger decisions, like where you want to be cared for, you know, could be I really, really want to be looked after at home if it's possible and not be admitted to hospital. Um, or like like Sarah says, it could be those little decisions. Um, one that I often think about is someone I know who has tinnitus and can't stand being in a quiet room. And I just think if no one knew that about that person and they became unwell and unable to let that be known and they were there listening to the ringing of, in their ears and not having that background noise to to drown it out you know that would be really a really uncomfortable situation for that person that could easily be avoided by you know writing down an advanced care plan and saying you know please please have the radio on in the background because it helps with my tinnitus yeah and then, and then bigger bigger discuss decisions sorry bigger decisions might be you know somebody might say think that they would absolutely not want to have a tube to be fed through now if it's something that's really important to them and they and they really don't think that they would want something like that then what we do in our team is we would we would have that conversation with them but we would also bring in other professionals to help them to make that final decision so we might bring in a dietitian or a speech and language therapist who can actually show you them the 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 tube talk to them about what it would be like if they didn't have the tube if they weren't able to take food by mouth um and so that by the end of all that information gathering that they've got they can then make a decision for sure yes i definitely wouldn't want it or actually it's it's not as bad as i thought it would be and therefore i would accept it if that's what people thought i needed so it's it, it can be all different levels of decision making really. I think it's important to remember as well that there's a few things that you can't put in an advanced care plan so you can't use it to refuse basic care so things like keeping you warm, keeping you clean and keeping you safe and you yeah. can't ask for anything illegal either so you, you know you, you couldn't put in a request, request there for somebody to help you end your life. And, and you can't demand treatment but you can refuse treatment so that's something that not everybody realizes in in our health system that we um we can't demand to have things but if there's something specific that we really don't want to have then we can make that choice so if you need some help or guidance with your advanced care planning who should you approach is it something that you could talk to your ms health team about for sure I think I think for some teams it's still a new topic to talk about but um, the way we use the booklet is that um, you know we're using it a lot and we have a lot of experience but we we almost use this as a starting point for conversations um, and we might suggest that you know offer it to to our patients but the opposite way around you know patients could go to their healthcare professional whether that's their neurologist their physios, their nurses, whoever it is in the team, and say, you know, I've, I've read this booklet and, and I would like to um, know how I, how I take this forward and start thinking ahead um, of what I'd like, making my wishes known. So, yeah, either way. And I think if you approach your healthcare team and say, I'd like to start thinking about advanced care planning and, and I've read this booklet and, you know, how do I go about it? even if they're not confident themselves in supporting you through the process, they should be able to signpost you on to someone who can support you yes. through that. I think the other thing it's important to remember is to include your loved ones as well in your discussions so that they're you know, aware of your wishes as well in a, in a particular situation and, and they feel more prepared should it arise. Yeah. Um, evidently, you know, you'd hope that it wouldn't come to this, but um, on the sort of family topic, if you um, planned out your wishes and say a family member or someone close to you sort of rejected what you'd written down, would they have any standing with that? Is there anything that could happen then? So it's a really, really difficult situation when there's conflict with families. And I think we'd go back to the message that we've been talking about all through this and say, you know, this is why it's great to have these conversations in advance because you can have that all out in the open and establish what's really important to you. 
but obviously that doesn't always happen. And when there are family members or pe you know, people close to, to that person who don't agree with what's written down in the advanced care plan, it's, it comes down usually to a best interest decision. So if, if you don't have a lasting power of attorney who is then therefore speaking as the equivalent of you, then decisions about care are made in your best interest. And relatives will be consulted as part of that process, but they will be consulted as someone who knows that person really well. And they will be asked, what do you think that person would want in this situation? Now, it's, it's really hard, but it's, it's that subtle distinction. It's not, what do you want for this person? It's what do you think that person would want in this situation? And that will obviously be taken into account because we hope that you know, the, they will know that person well and will, would hopefully have a, an insight into what they would want. But if you've got an advanced care plan, then part of making that best interest decision is considering, does someone have any known wishes and preferences that apply in this situation? And having a written advanced care plan is a very clear indication of someone's wishes and preferences. So we would always talk to families and we would always try and negotiate them. And again, having that written advanced care plan, it's really helpful in being able to sit down with the family and look at it and go, look, this was really important to this person. It's so important. They wrote it down. You know, and that can often help resolve situations when, when you really sort of look at, well, this was what was important to them. This was what they wanted. You know, obviously, it doesn't always work, but it's, it does often help having that, that written down document. Is it protects it protects the family that um, you know if there is a crisis and and you become unwell, it stops the family from being in that situation when a doctor might be saying to them, "What do you think your mum would want?" And then perhaps having different opinions if they've actually spoken to uh, if you've actually spoken to the family, then they're then they then they've got a a joint. They know what's going to happen or what the, what you would want, so it, it stops um, you know differing deci decisions at that time or opinions. And I think it relieves a lot of pressure on family members mm. you know, when you're put in that situation, thinking what would what they, would they want? I've, you know, I've got to make a decision. Although you know, it's not the responsibility, unless you've got lasting power of attorney, it's not the responsibility of relatives to make those decisions. But having an advanced care plan, it takes some of that pressure off because you can just think, well, we know what this person wanted. So obviously we've talked a little bit about what happens if your family don't agree with what you've written down. Um, but in terms of things like health professionals and the more formal sides, if you've written something in your advanced care plan, does that mean that it will definitely go ahead? Uh, there might be some circumstances where your wishes might not be met. It might be that the health professionals looking after you don't think the care or treatment you've requested is actually appropriate in those circumstances. And so then, you know, they don't have to follow your wishes. But, you know, there's also there can be unseen circumstances as well. You, you might have in your advanced care plan that you don't want to go into hospital under any circumstances. But then you might be involved in an accident. You might break a bone and... For that to be treated appropriately, you'd have to be taken into hospital so again. Um, you know, it, although it's in your advance care plan, you know, that you'd want to go into hospital to have that treated. And also, you know, sometimes you might have, have, have mentioned that you want a particular friend or a family member to provide you with care. And it just might be that they're not able to give that. For example, you might have said, you know, I really want my sister to can do this and it might be because of your sister's family circumstances that they're not available to do that or they might just might not want to do it. Sarah touched on it earlier about how you can't you can't demand a particular treatment so all of us have the right to to accept or refuse any treatment that's offered to us mm. but we can't go and go to the doctor and demand I want this specific thing if it's not clinically appropriate yes. so for example if you go to your GP and say, I've got a cold, give me some antibiotics. Then your GP will say, actually, no, the cold is caused by a virus. A virus is not 
treated with antibiotics, they won't work on it. So I'm not going to give you a prescription for antibiotics because it would be inappropriate. Um, but we, of the available options, you can accept or decline whatever you, you want and you have to make the decision that's right for you. And does the publication or is there somewhere that you can go that will sort of set out what the treatment options are that would be appropriate or is it just something that um, you need to research as part of your MS? Everybody's MS is very different. So there are some common themes about things that, that may happen more often if someone has advanced MS. Um, and those are certainly things that it's worth talking through with your MS team about what the options might be for you in the future. But it's impossible to say exactly what, what could happen and what could be available. Um, and apart from anything else, then medicine is changing all the time and we're having new developments and, and we hopefully there are going to be more and more new options for people. But certainly if, you, if you're noticing, say for example, you're having more issues with swallowing and you're thinking, well, if this carries on and if this gets worse, then maybe one day we might be considering feeding tubes. Then those are the type of things that you might want to explore. <laughs> I was going to say um, another thing might be that, that you've, you don't feel that you would be able to stay at home, for example, and that you would, um, because you wouldn't be able to manage, how would the care look like? Would you want 24 hour care or would you think well actually I think I'd like to go into a nursing home by thinking about that in advance there may be nursing homes that you think I absolutely would never like to go to that one but I wouldn't mind this one or this one if you were in a crisis and you were in hospital and being discharged from hospital if your family know which which care homes you quite like but which ones you absolutely would not want to go to then, then it, op it gives them a bit more of an option of where, where to start looking, at least, rather than, you know, 20 nursing homes locally, which one to go for and just trying to pick out which one. They've got a bit more of a guidance. So that is something that we talk to our patients about. If it's, some, if it's something that they might have in the future of needing to go to a nursing home, um, to start looking at that you know well in advance and just just get a feel for the place and, and which places they might consider moving to but places that they definitely would not consider moving to look um you know we do look at some of of the sort of common areas and common things that can happen in ms that you might want to think about um you know so things like infections you know you might say in your advanced care plan you'd be happy to have infections if you uh, if you've got a UTI you'd be happy to have antibiotics for it um but a more, more serious infection you you might think actually no I, you know I'd, I'd like like nature to take its course and, and wouldn't want that treated you know it might be if you're recovering from a fall um you know what you might like to have in that situation as well and um, we talked a little bit earlier actually about you know this not an advanced care plan not being about end of life, but you can include that kind of things in your advanced care plan. So you might want to think about, you know, not only, you know, where you'd like to die, but what you'd like to happen afterwards. So, you know, if you're really not religious and you wouldn't want a really religious funeral, you could have that in there, or actually if you were quite a spiritual person, and that was really important. Is it important to mention that an advanced care plan isn't in place of a will, like you can't, switch that out in place of it or one of the tools i guess you know will having a will is one of the advanced care planning tools mm -hmm. that can be completed okay as well as as well as organ donation um advanced decision to refuse treatment mm -hmm. preferred priorities of care and all the other um different tools that that's available for advanced care planning okay yeah, so I guess it sort of feeds into the, the overall plan. Yes. That's good to know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The MS Trust is a UK-based charity, so we cover not just England, but um, Scotland, Wales and Northern, Northern Ireland as well. Are the sort of 
not rules, but the guidance um, for advanced care planning the same across all the different nations or are there some variations that people may run into? Yeah, um, whilst we were working on thinking ahead, it became obvious that it is a bit of a minefield and there are lots of variations across the different nations, um, sometimes in terms of terminology. So um, in, in England and Wales, it's called an advanced care plan, but it, it's got a different name in Scotland. Um, it's called anticipated care planning in Scotland. Um, and, and not only sort of different names, but the legality of things as well. So for example, in advance of the refused treatment in England and Wales, if it's, if it's been written correctly and signed correctly, then it's a legally binding document. Whereas in Scotland, it's known as an ad advanced directive and it's not legally binding. So it's really important for people to find out, you know, the correct terms for the area of the UK they live in and what is and isn't legally binding where. And is all that information based um, in the publication? It, it is, yeah. Um, and we, we signpost to, to different resources in, in, in different places. I mean, even things like lasting power of attorney, the way that you set that up in England and Wales is different how it's, to how it's done in Scotland and Northern Ireland as well. So we've signposted to all that information within the book. Brilliant. Um, so just to finish up, what tips would you each share with people who are looking to have those potentially challenging conversations with family, friends or perhaps someone close to them? I think it's about prioritising what's important to you and making sure that that you that, that what is important is, is, you know, you can get that message across to, to your loved ones or, or family members or healthcare professionals. So, you know, it's thinking about which, how, how do you want to be if you weren't, how would you want to be looked after if you weren't um, able to say out loud or make your, your wishes known? Yeah. I think it's a way of giving you a sense of control over your life. And, mm -hmm. and I think it's a good way of exploring as well as, as whether your wishes are actually realistic. And then if they're not, it, you know, it gives you the chance to explore other options as well. And I think it's a way of, you know, giving both you and your family a little bit of peace of mind that, you know, if, if further down the line, you know, something does happen, you know, your family are aware of your wishes, the health, health professionals involved in your care are, are aware of your wishes, and they'll do the best to follow those wishes. And I would say, be brave and open the conversation, because once you start talking, it gets easier. Um, we sometimes find that people say, oh, oh, I've been thinking about the future and, and they get a response of, oh, you don't want to think about that. Oh, that's a bit morbid. And um, actually, no, planning ahead, planning for the future, you know, plan for the worst, but hope for the best. You know, having those plans in place, like you say, it gives people that control back in their lives and, and that security of knowing what's important to you is, is known just in case there was a time when you weren't able to to let that be known yourself and as you say Ellie although you might get some of those negative responses of oh you don't want to talk about that you never know you may actually open up some um positive conversations yeah. someone else in your family may say oh actually oh. Uh, these are my wishes too and it might lead to something really positive mm. absolutely yes you never know we people are very good at protecting each other and you get one member of the family thinking, oh, I don't want to talk about that. I might upset them. And the other member of the family is also thinking, well, maybe we ought to talk about that. But I, if I bring it up, I might upset them. And, and both these people are there protecting each other, but both thinking maybe we should be talking about that. And then we go in and say, let's have this conversation. And then it, it all opens up. Yeah, you can have some really positive conversations. Um, so just to say uh, thank you so much to the three of you for joining me today as I mentioned earlier it's a very hot day um, so I really appreciate you spending some time in warm and stuffy offices or living rooms or wherever you are um, to record this one um, and thank you for sharing your insights on such um, an important topic for not just the MS community but lots of other people as well. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.
Now, if this was a commercial podcast, here's where there would usually be an ad break. But as we're a charity, we don't do that. So instead, we'd like to take this time to tell you about some of the ways that the MS Trust can help you with advanced care planning. As we've discussed, our Thinking Ahead publication offers guidance and information for anyone looking to find out more about the topic. Planning ahead can also include thinking about writing a will. It offers you the chance to recognise special relationships, safeguard your families and ensure that your wishes are carried out in the way that you would like. And many people also choose to remember a charity in their will, which as well as being an incredibly meaningful way to go on to supporting the causes that you care deeply about, uh, can also have tax benefits. So you can speak to your lawyer to find out about that. Um, a gift in your will to the MS Trust is an amazing way to help us plan for the future so that we can continue to take, make sure that no one has to face MS alone. You can find out a little bit more about remembering the MS Trust in your will and also check out our legacy jargon buster because there can be quite a few confusing different uh, words in there. So you just need to visit our website, which is mstrust.org.uk and go to forward slash legacy. So L-E-G-A-C-Y legacy. So I think obviously there were some really interesting points that um, Sarah and Ellie and Ali all made in that discussion it's really important to remember as i think we we've touched on already that advanced care planning isn't just about like planning for death it doesn't Mm. have to be a negative thing sometimes it's just about how you start those conversations with family and friends and just making sure that you kind of feel as though you can have them (laughs) i think i think you're right and i think you know as a as a western society but i think we're quite scared to talk about things like this, um, death and aging, or all, all scares people, even though it's going to happen to all of us, you know. Um, I feel like, you know, there's certain things that that you end up doing plans for in life, like, you know, to be practical. So for instance, if, if you're going to have a baby, you're encouraged to write a birth plan. And I know, you know, that's maybe something more that people are looking forward to, and it's exciting, but it's also very much about your medical needs. So for instance, when I were having a baby I knew that there were certain things I didn't want to be done because I have MS I also wanted to make sure to say that there is treatment I can have or I can't have Um, so really it's that kind of getting your practical hat on and thinking about it in that way rather than I think it's quite easy when you think about the subject that you get very down and, and you get very reminded about your own mortality but at the same time I feel like when you get diagnosed with with something like MS you, you might start thinking about it anyway. Um, and I, I, I know, you know, everybody's different as well from person to person. Um, both my parents have passed away. Um, and I think I can be quite practical about these things. When I heard about the, the, the publication, I was like, oh, well, that's, that's a really good idea. You know, that, that's, I, I'd like to read that. I'd like, to, and it didn't scare me. Well, I, I can know other people who would be like, no, 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 I don't want to think about any of those sort of things. But um, like, you know, they were saying in the, in, in, in the, I think it was Sarah that said that, you know, they would think about it as well, not just for people with MS. And I think it's also another thing that might be important to, to, to mention that it's not just because, you know, people with MS have supposedly got a shorter lifespan than, than, than average population either, because there is information on the website about this, on the life expectancy, if you want to read more. But it's not much of a difference between us and, um, or, you know, between us people with MS and, and the general population. So, so even though it might feel like a scary subject, I think it's just trying to think about it actually being practical. And a lot of it is kind of useful information to have um, when situation might get a bit tricky because you you really don't know what's around the corner. It doesn't necessarily need to be that it's MS that's causing whatever situation you might be in. You know, there's, my husband always said when I was diagnosed and I was feeling a bit down by it because we don't know what's happened tomorrow, you can get hit by a bus. It, it's it's a bit morbid but you know it's it's true isn't it yeah that's very true I I've had similar conversations with my mom um when I've been going on holiday and things and you sort of see on the news websites obviously very dramatic um example here but you'd see examples of like plane crashes and I'd say oh what if I what if I go away and there's a plane crash my mom would say to me but you could go out tomorrow and yeah, get hit by a bus. You just don't know what's going to happen. And as you sort of mentioned, Helena, I think it's really important to reiterate that we're not having this discussion because 
people with MS need to plan any more necessarily than people without MS. It's just a really important conversation to have. Um, I've got members of my family who maybe don't, you know, they have underlying health conditions as many people do but they we've had conversations like this but not because not for a specific reason Mm. um you know not everyone will be able to approach it in this way but me personally like my dad and my dad's side of the family are quite quite casual and quite good at making jokes about it and things and when my grandma was still alive she'd always make comments about how she was scared of bugs so when she passed away we all knew because she was scared of bugs that she didn't want to be buried because she didn't Mm. like that idea. Um, But again, it was like in a lighthearted way. And I think in some ways humor does help. I know I've I've had the conversations with my grandmother when she was alive as well. Um, And um, she went into care and um, they were trying to figure out what was, um, she had had a stroke and she had some other issues going on and and they were trying to do a lot of tests to to find out what was wrong. And she was just feeling so bad from all these invasive tests and things. And I think both me and my aunt, we were really worried and we wanted to know what was wrong. But at the same time, you know, this is a person who's living and they're in pain and they don't want to get all that kind of. So, so you had to respect what she had. And it would have been easier in, in some ways if she would have had a plan that would have said, no, I don't want this done. And then we would have had to sort of step away and respect that, that that was what, what her wishes were. And I think sometimes it can be also you know for for family because family members might have different opinions about what should be done so if you already stated what you want or don't want um then that will make it easier for 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 family as well because we all know that family can can argue Mm. (laughs) it was actually quite interesting recently we spoke to someone um who works in hospice care and one of the ways they sort of approached advanced care planning was to say that you know you when you have a house or you go on holiday or you buy a car you take out insurance and it doesn't mean you know that you're going to have a car accident it's just kind of preparing for if that does happen and it's like covering yourself and I think that's a really good way to look at it actually yeah absolutely I think I think that's it if you just think about it as a practical thing and this is you know it's might and it's not like an end end date that this is going to happen here it's going to happen there and and you can change your mind as well you know you you might feel like well this is something I feel very strongly about now but then something else later on and 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 I feel like you know some of the issues that was discussed in this book um I really don't have an opinion about yet um other things I might have an opinion about so you know I think I think it's one of those things that it's just good to start talking about it um before before I was going to say not before it's too late but before before the situation is there because I, I think it's you, you know what it is clearly uh, the title thinking ahead is it, it's about being practical and about being useful and helpful for for whoever is looking after you um when things might go um wrong mm, and Ellie and Sarah sort of said that didn't they that you know you don't have to have all of the answers right now no one's expecting Mm. you to and sometimes I think we forget that we as humans we're not like created as a a finished article it's all an evolution and people are entitled to change their minds or their opinions on things and sometimes you know it can they your opinion can change as a result of a discussion with a MS health professional or a friend or family member or you know you might stick to your guns and that's also completely fine but it's just about you know being open to having those discussions I think the key message here is really communication yeah um so yeah and I think you know instead of sort of saying we're going to write this and we're going to write the will we're going to do it's more about you know can we have a chat about this and 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 if you feel like maybe that some part of your family members don't want to talk about these things then then maybe there's another friend or someone else that you can sort of start having the chats with and then sort of eventually get to the people that you actually need to talk to Uh, and also you know talk to your MS nurse or 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 other you know people with MS who might be in the same situation as you there's always someone to talk to I think obviously as we've mentioned talking about advanced care planning isn't always easy but remember that your MS team are there to support you and you can also contact the MS Trust Inquiry Service between 9am and 5pm Monday to Friday except on UK bank holidays if you've got any questions about life with MS. They're available on 0800 032 
3839 or you can email ask at mstrust.org.uk and someone will get back to you as soon as possible. Are you hot, Emma? I think we mentioned a few times. <laughs> it's, really, it's really warm today. Mm. <laughs> uh, oh, and we're actually we're, we're recording this over video as well. So if you're listening to the podcast, you might think this is strange, but we, we, we have a we, we decided to experiment a bit. So we, we put it up as a video as well on YouTube. So if you if you really want to know what we look like, you can head over and look at our sweaty faces <laughs> on YouTube. Um, but that aside, I was going to say our next podcast is actually going to be on the topic of heat sensitivity. Uh, and if you're one of the many people whose Emma symptoms are affected by the rise in temperatures, why don't you get in touch with us and let us know some top tips that you have for dealing with the heat or some of the issues that you are struggling with? Um, we'd love to hear from you and your comments may even be featured on the episode. Um, so uh, you can drop us a voice note or a message via WhatsApp on 0745830 Alternatively, you can email us on my story at mstrust.org.uk. But we'd love a voice note because we want to hear your voice. We'd like to hear lots of different voices for, for, from people with them as well. Yeah, and it's a brilliant way to get involved with the podcast without having to uh, show your face on screen, because I know a lot of people aren't keen on that one. Obviously, we do welcome video content as well if you do want to show your face. But Absolutely, um, yes. Yeah, voice notes and messages are great as well. We should just point out that our WhatsApp, me WhatsApp messages aren't monitored by the MS Helpline team. Uh, so if you've got a question, as we mentioned earlier, that needs answering, you can contact them directly on the number that we mentioned, which is 0800 032 3839 or email ask at mstrust.org.uk. You can also find uh, the MS Trust on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram. And you can find this podcast on Spotify, Google, Apple Podcasts, and Amazon Music, and also YouTube now. <laughs> and get in touch and do, like they say, like and subscribe. And we would also like to say a big thank you to Anne Chapman Audio for the music for this podcast. And we'll see you next time for our heat sensitivity podcast. Now I'm going to go and have a shower. <laughs> Bye. Bye.